you very much indeed. And, um, and well done on all you're doing. Uh, it, there's nothing more important in the current economic climate than uh, encouraging the growth and success of entrepreneurs. So uh, everything we can all do to uh, assist in that is going to be paramount importance over the next few years. Uh, I started Cavendish in uh, some 32 years ago in 1988 uh, because I saw a window of um, uh, opportunity for people who wanted to sell a business and wanted to be advised by someone who had no other interest than just helping them maximize the value to sell a business. So for 32 years, Cavendish specialized exclusively in sell side M&A. Uh, and in that time, we've sold, well, over 600 businesses, uh, all in the SME space. So I guess you could say we're, we're sort of getting the hang of it. Um, and then uh, in a, a few years ago, we thought to us, as our business evolved, we thought, how do we uh, capitalize on our business? What, what are we going to do to expand? And we did have the idea of, of doing an IPO ourselves. And we went to talk to FinCap, who we knew were the best in the business, about what do they think of uh, the possibility of us uh, doing some sort of IPO. And they said, um, you are uh, not, it's not going to happen for you. Uh, you haven't got the right criteria and you're a bit small, but funny you should come and talk to us because we were just thinking that as uh, an AIM broker uh, specializing in uh, AIM SME markets, that uh, what would work well with our business was an M&A house. And so uh, negotiations happened and we ended up merging Cavendish with FinCap and contemporaneously listing on the AIM. Quite a complicated transaction, but particularly as we were an LP and they were a limited company. But it meant I've actually um, been through all three, uh, tr all, all transactions that I've advised other people to do at once at the same time. Uh, and that successfully happened uh, and nearly two years ago. Um, and you, many people said, well, that was good because you got us at the top of the market. And um, uh, although I, most of the partners rolled over two thirds of their equity, nonetheless, that is right. Uh, there, there was a sort of top of the market feeling. And many entrepreneurs have come to me in recent um, days to say, or recent months, to say there's a great feeling of having, frankly, missed out. Uh, they were waiting for Brexit. They were waiting for the election. They were waiting for Brexit to actually happen. And then suddenly they were into the, um, they were into the uh, COVID and they felt you know, all, all deals were off and they missed out on an opportunity to capitalize on the value of their business. And um, many people have said to me, well, I, I know I've missed out. I don't want to miss out next time. What do I do to make sure I don't miss out next time? And um, uh, I'm kicking myself that I missed it and my partner's kicking me even harder, but that's the reality of what we're going to do about it. Um, now, as it happens, it, 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 it might be that there is a very small window of opportunity for entrepreneurs to consider. The big driver for many entrepreneurs at the moment is uh, the, the, the worry about capital gains tax and the rumor uh, or rumors in the press that uh, the chancellor might seek to increase capital gains tax, which is currently very benign for entrepreneurs. As, as you know, it's by and large 10% for the first million and by and large 20% thereafter. And that first million can be spread around a number of shareholders. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's between 10 and 20%, which is very attractive, whereas the top rate of income tax is 45%. And many people are worried that there will be an equalization of capital gains and income tax, which in my opinion would be extremely bad news and is something I hope the APBG entrepreneurs led by Philip will uh, pick up the baton to fight. But it's, it's a worry. And for an entrepreneur, the delta is enormous. Um, there are really three possibilities of what might happen in November. The first, best, is Chancellor says, um, I'm not going to change capital gains tax, leaving as it is. Uh, I might tinker with a few other things, fuel duty, corporation tax, and so on, but I'll leave capital gains tax. Second, worst, he says capital gains tax goes up from midnight tonight, whether that's in its entirety or above X million, 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, we don't know. So that's second. Third, least worst, is he says capital gains tax is going up but not until next financial year, which starts, of course, on 6 April. And if that's the case, then there is an opportunity for entrepreneurs to uh, achieve some sort of crystallize, some sort of capital gain between now and 5th April. 
And a, a number of people have come to us in recent weeks to say, I want to plan to get that. Um, so I want to start planning now such that I could crystallize 5th April. And if in November, when the autumn budget takes place, there isn't a rise in capital gains tax, I can always pause for thought. But to enable me to reach the 5th April window, what do I need to do now to get uh, a deal closed by 5th April? Uh, and there's a lot you can do to get cracking uh, to make that happen. Um, this webinar is, is, is mainly about the longer term uh, uh, process of selling or uh, doing an IPO of a business uh, over a longer term. And there's, there's, um, uh, there's a lot you could do uh, if you sat down and said to yourself, right, I missed the last wave, I'm now going to catch the next uptick. When's the next uptick going to be? Probably sort of somewhere around um, uh, three years time when uh, in three years time, hopefully the economy is growing. Uh, uh, the economy will be tilted towards growth as we get towards an election and the COVID is hopefully well behind us. And if you were to do a three year plan now as an entrepreneur, it might be a completely different business plan if you're minded to sell a business than if you are minded to carry on running the business for a longer time. So there's sort of the sort of things that you might consider, which are apposite to this call. For example, or, or for example, sell or IPO. Um, you would reconstruct your investment profile to uh, make investment now, not worry about the short-term impact on cash flow and profit and loss, so that the three year, in three years' time, the, the value of that investment will come through. Same, and that investment it may not just just be in plant machinery and capital. It could be, for example, in the brand. You could launch a big investment in brand now, knowing that the returns will only be two or three years away. But that makes sense for you as an entrepreneur if you're turning things on its head and you're running the business for capital, not revenue. Uh, you would have a good look at your own corporate governance. It may be that as a private run business, you, you, the corporate governance is very different to that which might be appropriate as a vehicle uh, that's going to do an IPO or subject to a corporate acquisition. And you most importantly need to think, how could the business run without you? If you're the sole owner of the business and the entrepreneur, the biggest worry buyers have about such businesses is, uh, can, you, can the business survive if you disappear off to the Caribbean island with your well-gotten gains? So setting up management structures that allow the show that the business is, is run by uh, your management is vital. It is not just that they do it, but they are seen to do it. So minuting management meetings where you're not present, where decisions are made by management that prove that the business is, is independent. Uh, and perhaps thinking about a, an incentive plan that, that, that encourages your colleagues to work with you to that exit so they have some sort of benefit as well. The um, one, one business we work with had a very interesting idea, which is they decided to write the information memorandum now for what they would want it to look like in three years time. And they then work to get the business to that shape uh, in, in three years time. A really interesting exercise, not didn't take that long and it, it provided a lot of focus and thought, what would I like this business to look like in three years time in terms of an information memorandum? And we did that. Likewise, having a good look at your accountancy policies sounds unbelievably dull and ditch water stuff, but many accounting policies for businesses are there because you've just inherited them or they just they always were there and nobody's questioned them. But some, particularly revenue recognition and to some extent depreciation, can make a massive difference to, 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 to profit. And revenue recognition in particular can make a massive difference to EBITDA. And, you, and most private companies are run not for the benefit of HMRC. They're run for the they're run benefit of, of, of maximizing cash flow, uh, minimizing tax, uh, and other matters. Whereas if you're in a, in a period prior to sell or IPO, you might want to think differently. You might want to turn it on its head and think about how you, how you improve the bottom line. And little things like the chairman's statement in your audited accounts, careful of your, be careful of your words, be careful what you write. Remember that a purchaser will read that assiduously in two or three years, two or three years time. Um, because you're a private company, by and large, everybody on this call, you are in the position of, you have the luxury of choosing who you want to sell to. And therefore, you might well decide you want to sell to a, a business that you frankly 
feel proud to sell to and somebody who's who you know will look after your employees and you can take the time to select the ideal purchaser as opposed to having someone imposed upon you so thinking early about who would you like or what type of business would you like and one entrepreneur came to me and said the only business i want to sell to is an overseas business why because an overseas business will keep my brand they'll keep my employees they'll pay a premium to come into the uk uh, and it's much more acceptable to me than, than selling a business to a uk competitor so spending time thinking about that and uh slightly off piste but for, as an entrepreneur thinking about life after the sale for example what else is there in your life if your life is solely uh, uh, evolving around your business which it is for many people particularly entrepreneurs now's the time to start developing other interests so that the sale means that you can do other things after the sale and not uh, uh, at the point of sale uh, re get a, get to the to the line look over the line and decide you can't do it because there's nothing else in your life that will fill your time which i have seen happen of, of a sort of vendor's remorse um, and uh, you can uh, at the same time start planning on um, uh, on managing your funds uh, which will be liquid after the sale and i know we've got one or two people uh, on the on the call at the moment i recognize myself as julius bear and others who were excellent at looking after your funds but with a bit of planning uh, particularly uh, in respect of inheritance tax which changes after a sale because you no longer have an asset eligible for business property relief it's good to, to start early. Um, I focused on the sale. Um, in my experience, most entrepreneurs do actually want to sell rather than an IPO. An IPO, when you're selling an IPO, you're selling an event which you cannot tell somebody the price. You cannot give anybody any certainty. You can't guarantee it will happen, but you can tell them there'll be a million pounds of costs to get there. That's not an easy sale. But for some people, it does work, particularly if you, for example, are a partnership and you want the flexibility of some partners realizing their, their share and other partners staying in and growing a business. Uh, there are IPOs happening. Um, there have been two really in, in the recent times uh, in the SME space. The institutions are very selective about what they want. They like investing in medical businesses. Uh, they like investing in businesses that have a balance sheet need from the medical sector. Uh, and they like investing in businesses that have a balance sheet need to grow to take advantage of the opportunities that have presented themselves in the current environment. Uh, so a good example of that was an IPO we did um, uh, recently of a company called Alexia, which is a consultancy. It had good profit uh, uh, history. It had good profit potential. Uh, it was a consultancy. Some people wanted out. Most people wanted to stay. It had decent staff. The institutions were offered a decent slice of the business, which is all always important and the management team were very very credible so that was helpful the um uh so the so i hope that's 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 not too long uh thumbnail sketch of the opportunities available to people and i would be extremely happy to uh, take questions uh, uh along with kevin here on in